Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Togoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This video is going to focus on blood supply to the nervous system. And we're going to see that this blood supply is ultimately going to come from really two vessels. One, the internal carotid artery. This is going to be a major player. And then also the vertebral arteries. Okay. But let's first go and look at the arch of the aorta, or the aortic arch. Now we know that there are three vessels, or three major branches that come off of the arch of the aorta. The first one, so most proximal to the aorta itself, is the brachiocephalic artery. Then next to that we have the left common carotid artery, and then the left subclavian artery. Now, these two right here, of course, constitute the subclavian artery and the common carotid artery on the left side. Remember that the brachiocephalic artery uh, is going to then bifurcate into the right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. So we have a right and a left for both the subclavian and common carotid arteries, but remember that on the right side, uh, these two vessels actually branch from the brachiocephalic artery. Okay. So let's first talk about the subclavian arteries. Now obviously I've only got things drawn for the right subclavian artery, but understand that it would be the same thing for the left subclavian artery. Okay, so here's our right subclavian artery. Now the subclavian artery is going to continue away from the heart toward the right side, and eventually we know it's going to pass underneath the clavicle over the margin of the first rib, and it will become the axillary artery on the right side. But well before it does that, it's going to give off the vertebral artery. Now, this specifically is going to be the right vertebral artery. We would also have a left vertebral artery that I have shown right here that would ultimately come from the left subclavian artery. Okay, so there's an imaginary vessel right here, and it literally is the left vertebral artery. Okay. Now, these vertebral arteries are going to fuse together, the right vertebral artery and the left vertebral artery, and they're going to fuse into this artery right here, which is called the basilar artery. Now, we'll come back to this in a minute because we first need to talk about several branches that come off of the vertebral arteries. Okay? Now, I only have them shown here for the right vertebral artery. Understand they also come off of the left. So the first branch that comes off, this is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Now, when we talk about the vertebral arteries, they're going to ascend up the cervical spine and ultimately go into the brainstem region. Okay, So you can imagine if this is a cerebellar artery, it's going to be pretty high up because recall that the cerebellum is actually posterior to the pons, which is right here. That's the middle part of the brainstem. So we're way up there. Okay, So those vertebral arteries ascend up the cervical spine and eventually make their way to the brainstem, where they fuse into the basilar artery. But roughly around the level of the medulla, their vertebral arteries give off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So this would be the right one. There would, of course, be one coming off of the left side as well. Now, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is often just called the pica, okay, for short, for obvious reasons. And the pica supplies the lateral part of the medulla oblongata. It obviously is going to supply parts of the cerebellum, particularly the inferior part of the cerebellum. Also, it's going to contribute to the choroid plexus in the fourth ventricle, and then also the fourth ventricle itself. So pica is an extremely important artery, and in fact, if an individual has a stroke of this artery, they end up with severe deficits in the medulla oblongata, particularly the lateral side of the medulla. And actually, a, a stroke in the posterior inferior cerebellar artery is often called lateral medullary syndrome. And it's really going to affect most of the functions of the medulla, particularly those that are associated with the lateral side of it. Okay, So that's the pica. Now, there's a branch that comes off of the pica called the posterior spinal artery. Now, there's an anterior spinal artery and a posterior spinal artery. In about 75% of individuals, the posterior spinal artery branches off of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. That's about 75% of people. The other 25%, this posterior spinal artery branches directly off of the corresponding vertebral artery. But in any case, the posterior spinal artery 
is going to supply the posterior one-third of the spinal cord. Now, as we continue up the vertebral arteries, they're going to give off an anterior spinal artery. So you could imagine if the posterior spinal artery get, uh, supplies the posterior one-third of the spinal cord, the anterior spinal artery is going to supply the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. Um, you can have an injury to that anterior spinal artery. This could be caused uh, by an extremely rapid and strong flexion type of movement. Um, and that will damage this artery, potentially. And if that gets damaged, then the two-thirds of the spinal cord on the anterior side in that region will be damaged. And this is called anterior spinal cord syndrome or anterior cord syndrome. Okay? But that would be damage or an injury to the anterior spinal artery. But that artery branches off of the vertebral artery on the corresponding side. Now, you can see here these two major branches off of the vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries are going to continue ascending up, and they're eventually going to fuse into the basilar artery. Okay, So the basilar artery, this is literally just a fusion of the two vertebral arteries. Now, the first branch that comes off of the basilar artery is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So we already saw the pica. This one is the ica, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. This artery mainly supplies the infralateral pons or the inferior lateral pons and then the antero inferior cerebellum or the anterior inferior cerebellum. Okay, thus the name anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Right? Uh, you can also have a stroke of this artery uh, but if you have a stroke of the ica it will mainly affect the pons that is the infralateral pons, whereas the pica, a stroke of this artery, will affect the lateral medulla. I have a video somewhere on my channel where we talk about strokes of different arteries in the brainstem, and depending on what the patient presents with, you can actually deduce uh, which one of these arteries the stroke was in. So for example, if the person has deficits of pontine functions, or in other words, uh, functions of the pons, it's more likely an anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Whereas if the person has more medullary functions that have been uh, negatively affected, it's more likely a pica stroke. Okay, So that's anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Now then, going up further, the basilar artery is going to give off a bunch of what we call pontine arteries. These are just arteries that supply the pons. Now I want to make this perfectly clear. I didn't show it on this side, but there is an ica on this side. Okay, This would be the right ica. The left ica would be over here. There's also some pontine arteries coming out over here on this side, but again, I didn't show those for the sake of space. Now, the basilar artery is going to give off one more branch before it bifurcates, and those branches are going to be the left and right superior cerebellar arteries. And again, you can pretty much guess what this is going to serve, the superior half of the cerebellum, but also some parts of the midbrain. Now, the basilar artery itself is going to be the major blood supply to the midbrain. Okay? So if you have a stroke of the basilar artery, we would expect midbrain functions to be negatively affected. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So the basilar artery gives off three major branches. The anterior inferior cerebellar artery, or ICA. If we count these as one, the pontine arteries. And then the superior cerebellar arteries. Now you can see right here where my mouse is. This is the termination of the basilar artery as it bifurcates. And it's going to bifurcate into a right and a left posterior cerebral artery. Notice it's not cerebellar. This is now posterior cerebral artery. And as soon as this basilar artery bifurcates in this way, we now start to form this overall structure which is called the circle of Willis. Now the circle of Willis, also called the circulus arteriosus, uh, this is really just a circle of anastomosing arteries that really give major blood supply to different parts of the cerebrum. This is extremely important, and also the fact that an anastomosis like this uh, actually allows alternate blood flow in the event that there was some kind of a blockage. Now, obviously, there can be a blockage uh, that's severe enough to cause a stroke of some part of the cerebrum, but it is a protective mechanism to have this anastomotic system like this. Okay, so these posterior cerebral arteries are going to supply the posterior part of the cerebrum. 
which would be the occipital lobes. So for example, this one over here, this would be the, uh, the right posterior cerebral artery. This would serve the right occipital lobe. This is the left one. This would supply the left occipital lobe. Okay. Now, I mentioned that there's two major vessels that are supplying all of this. We mentioned one of them was the vertebral arteries. We're going to come back now and talk about the internal carotid artery, and here's why. We'll see this in just a second. So remember, we have those common carotid arteries. Again, I'm showing this one coming from the left side, uh, but again, the same thing would also happen on the right. That common carotid artery is going to bifurcate into an external carotid artery, which we're not talking about here. That will be the next video, and the internal carotid artery. Now the internal carotid artery, unlike the external half, the internal carotid artery gives off no branches in the neck. The external carotid artery gives off a ton of branches in the neck. But this one doesn't give off any. It's going to hold on to its blood, and it's going to continue up here and ultimately form part of the circle of Willis. So probably up to about right here, this would be the internal carotid artery. Okay. And eventually, the internal carotid artery will become the middle cerebral artery. Okay, so right at this point, kind of right there, okay, uh, the internal carotid artery branches to give the middle cerebral artery, and the middle cerebral artery is going to supply the lateral cortices. So, for example, the temporal lobes and the insular lobes. All right, and we have a connection between the posterior cerebral artery right here and the internal carotid artery right here. And that's called the posterior communicating artery. So the posterior communicating artery is an anastomosis between the posterior cerebral artery and the internal carotid artery right here, which eventually becomes the middle cerebral artery. All right. Then we have another branch that comes off of the internal carotid artery right here. That is this one, the anterior cerebral artery. Notice that both of these, this one right here and this, all of this is anterior cerebral artery. And the anterior cerebral arteries are going to supply the frontal lobes of the brain, that is the cerebrum, and the superior part of the medial parietal lobes. Okay? Um, so notice all of this right here, this is the left anterior cerebral artery. Over here, this is the right anterior cerebral artery. The two anterior cerebral arteries have an anastomosis between them right here. This is called the anterior communicating artery. All right, And so all of this, this circle right here, is one big anastomosis, and it is called the circle of Willis. So if we look at all the structures right here that are actually a part of the circle of Willis, First of all, we have those posterior cerebral arteries, right? We have the posterior communicating arteries. We do have the internal carotid arteries because they do serve as a branch uh, that lead off to the anterior cerebral artery right here. Then, of course, we have the anterior cerebral artery and then the anterior communicating artery. So those structures make up the circle of Willis. Now, the middle cerebral artery, understand that this one is really just a branch that actually goes off of the circle. So the middle cerebral artery is not actually a part of the circle of Willis. Rather, it branches off of a structure within the circle of Willis, which to be precise is the internal carotid artery. So the middle cerebral artery branches from that. But all of this collectively right here, this is the circle of Willis. And as you can see right here, the circle of Willis is really just providing blood to the cerebral cortex of the brain, among a few other structures, which we're not going to get into here. We really have two arteries right here that are the ultimate sources of everything. I would call those the internal carotid artery and then the vertebral arteries. And one really good way to learn this is to actually practice drawing all this out. It looks like a lot, but you should be able to get to a point where you can actually draw all this out pretty fast within a couple of minutes. So hopefully it helped. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.